This is First Pediatrics. Hi there, everyone. My name is Chris. And my name's Annie. And welcome back to First Pediatrics. Annie, so nice to have you on the podcast. Do you mind just telling a little about yourself? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I am a current fourth year med peds resident here at Michigan. Um, so lucky enough to get to spend um, half of my time on pediatrics and very excited to be joining the podcast today. Awesome. Yeah, we're just so lucky to have you. Could you remind our listeners a little bit about our podcast? Of course. So First Pediatrics is a peer-to-peer podcast geared towards pediatric resident education. Our goal here is to address your first management experiences by bringing you evidence-based content to help you on the wards and make daily life more manageable as a resident. Thanks, Annie. I understand our topic for today is about an approach to febrile neutropenia in oncologic patients. Would you mind telling us a little more about what inspired you to do this podcast? Yeah, for sure. So I am actually currently in the application process for PEDS Hemonc Fellowship. Um, So we'll find out about match day in about two weeks and very excited. But for that reason, you know, febrile neutropenia is near and dear to my heart and something that I will encounter so frequently as a PEDS Hemonc fellow and physician. But it's also something that even if you aren't planning on going into PEDS Hemonc, this is a commonly encountered clinical scenario on the inpatient wards when you're on night coverage in any outpatient clinic and in, in the ER. I think it'll be really applicable for everyone here, um, and hopefully over the next few minutes, we can review how to accurately diagnose a patient with neutropenic fever, understand the workup that needs to be done, and then review the treatment for these patients. That sounds like a great plan. Do you want to start with the case? Yeah, let's get into it. Um, So Chris, we're going to have you go back a couple years into intern year. Okay, I'm back. You're back. (laughs) You're you're on nights and you're covering the very busy PT monk service. Okay. You get a call from one of the nurses who tells you that a patient in bed 708 has a fever and they would like to know what you want to do next. Oh, that important question, what to do. Um, <laughs> so, gosh, knowing that they're a hemoc patient, I want to know if this is a true fever. So understanding how it was obtained and if this is the case, the first question that always comes to mind is, is this patient sick or not sick? And a way to determine that is to get a full set of vitals. I would also ask the nurse how they generally look. You know, these nurses are really experienced. I would ask them to, are you worried? Because they have just a good gestalt of like the overall picture, I feel like. Right. Perfect. I agree with all of that. So um, the nurse tells you that the fever is to 38.6 orally. Okay. Um, the pulse is 81, respiratory rate of 14, blood pressure of 110 over 74, which is at the patient's baseline. Mm-hmm. And the patient is otherwise pretty well appearing watching TV. Um, The nurse is not currently worried about the patient, but wanted to report the fever, so figured a phone call would be a quick and easy way to touch base about this. Yeah. So you chatted with the nurse, kind of, what do you want to do after this? You know, since we're overnight and time is often limited, the things I'd want to learn more about would be their oncologic diagnosis, Mm -hmm. their chemotherapy, any current meds, any and all hardware that they have, such as a central line, since this would change my management their vitals over the last 24 hours, such as any prior fevers, and most recent blood work. Right, 100%. And these should all be things, you know, that we should be able to find out on our sign out from the day team, um, which I think can be the best place to go look for all of that information in a concise place. And so we do look at our sign out and we learn that this is a 17-year-old patient she is a female with recently diagnosed B cell ALL. Okay. Um, she is also status post port placement, LP, and bone marrow biopsy three days ago, and now currently on cycle one, day three of her um, ALL protocol with vincristine, donorubicin, intrathecal cytirabine, and prednisone. Um, I love that you brought up a central line and said that it might change your management. Kind of what things would be different. Well, any patient who has a fever and has a central line, you have to worry about whether or not that line is infected with a bacterial infection. Mm -hmm. And sort of irregardless of the situation, that's always going to be at play as well. So that's, I guess, what's in my mind right now. Um, Yeah, exactly. Great thinking. And and in these patients, you know, you want to think about getting antibiotics started in them sooner rather than later. Um, anything else that you want to know from the patient's chart before you think about going to see them? So, um, you know, I would probably want to look to see if they have any labs uh, historically that I could review in the, the recent history. 
Yeah. Anything in particular? Oh, yeah. So CBC is, I guess, what was on my mind. Yeah. Specifically looking at the white blood cell count and then making sure it has a differential um, because Mm -hmm. you specifically want to look at the neutrophil count. And then any hemoc patient, I'm always looking at their hemoglobin and their platelets um, just to see where those are. Although with a fever, it's not necessarily going to change my management, but it's just important in this population. Mm-hmm. And then they're newly, yep. you know, you know, on chemotherapy, just thinking about other things that can happen, such as tumor lysis syndrome. So looking at any electrolyte abnormalities, you know, thinking about uric acid, LDH, potassium levels, phosphorus levels. Um, all of those things are in my mind, although like less significant from the fever standpoint, like I'm not worried about the fever in that, but it's just like things we worry about generally for these patients. Yeah. And always looking at the patient as a whole. So I think that's perfect. Um, and of course we're talking about febrile neutropenia, so neutrophils better be on the the top of your list Mm -hmm. of things to think about. Mm -hmm. Um, so we do have some labs for her. Um, Her CBC from this morning showed a total white blood cell count of 1, an absolute neutrophil count of 0.2, a hemoglobin of 8.4, and platelets of 49. Mm. Um, From a chemistry standpoint, her sodium was 138, potassium 4.1, bicarbonate 27, BUN was uh, 8, creatinine 0.41, and then uh, a phosphorus of 4.6, uric acid of 2.8, and LDH of 456. Um, so of course we're looking at that neutrophil <laughs> count, but anything else you're noticing on our labs, Chris? Yeah, that's a lot of labs. Um, <laughs> but you just running through it. They all sound like pretty normal, like nothing mm-hmm. that's jumping off the page other than the neutrophil count. Um, For sure. and then like hemoglobin and platelets, you know, if you're not familiar with those numbers, you know, the numbers I have in mind as thresholds is a hemoglobin of less than seven and platelets less than 10. So I'm hearing 8.4 for the hemoglobin. 49 for the platelets. So I'm not worried necessarily about those numbers right now, too. Perfect. Yeah, I think that sounds great. Um, Things to keep in mind with those low platelets are often like avoiding NSAIDs and then um, obviously holding any anticoagulation for patients with a platelet count of less than 50. Not applicable to her in this case, but I think great to just review those things. Yeah. Since you mentioned it, the NSAIDs, do you know the mechanism or or why we avoid those in kids that have a low platelet count? Yeah, so the NSAIDs can actually inhibit platelet aggregation. Um, so if you're worried about a bleed or, um, you know, cuts or anything like that in these patients, we want to make sure that we're not contributing to um, inability to form clots in the setting of a patient who already has low platelets. Okay, okay. Great question. And now, you know, we talked about that it looks like her electrolytes were within normal limits, thinking about tumor lysis syndrome, um, but that looked okay today for her. Um, So I think, like we said, the big things are the neutropenia. Um, Chris, do you happen to know what the definition of neutropenia is? You know, I think the definition is is anything less than 1,500 is defined as neutropenia. I know there's like different categories of severity, but Less than 500 is when I get clinically concerned and I hear this patient is at 0.2 or 200 right now. So below that 500 cutoff. Exactly. And we can also think about, in, especially in a patient with a fever, um, if they've had a previous admission for chemotherapy and their counts dropped below that 500 mark, even if they're not below that right now, we would still consider them neutropenic slash, you know, at risk for neutropenia. So she 100% qualifies. Um, And then thinking about a fever, of course, how are we defining that? Yeah. You know, it came up before. I don't think we defined it, but I I always tell families in any context, um, anything greater than 100.4 or 38 Celsius would be my definition of a fever. Exactly. Um, In our neutropenic patients, we're actually a little bit more specific. We need two readings of that 38 degrees Celsius or um, 100.4 Fahrenheit, at least one hour apart, or one single temperature of greater than 38.5 Celsius. Um, This may differ on your institution, but again, in relation to our neutropenic patients, these are our kind of two definitions of a fever. That's really helpful. And speaking of kind of neutropenic patients, one of the things I just wanted to highlight to make sure that we're, you know, keeping an eye on is that we really want to avoid any unnecessary instrumentation in these patients. Um, So specifically with areas with very thin mucosa, um, like the um, urethra and then the rectum, we're going to want to avoid any urinary catheters um, or Foley's straight catheterization. 
and then no rectal temperatures. It's so easy to introduce bacteria to these areas. Okay. And in patients who already have kind of a low ability to fight infections, we really don't want to introduce anything um, iatrogenically on our part. So just something important to keep in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. For sure. So now we know that this patient is neutropenic. She has a fever. Um, I'd say, you know, let's get a little pep in our step and try to go examine them. I'm always down to go see a patient, but I think in these patients, I might consider putting in some labs and maybe ordering some antibiotics before going to see them. What are your thoughts on that? Wow. Great catch. Um, you're the future hemonk doc here. Not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we know that everything in a hospital takes time. Um, but in these neutropenic fevers, Chris, you're so right that things are a little more time sensitive. Um, so we should always, before we're even seeing these patients, we should get a blood culture um, from all of the lumens of their central access, if they have it, and a peripheral culture. Blood culture guidelines might depend on your institution, but Annie, what other studies might you get? Um, a urinalysis, again, non-catheterized sample, maybe get some repeat labs, and then order stat antibiotics, um, specifically cefepime. Any idea why we choose cefepime to start with? Yeah, my understanding is it has really good gram-negative coverage and then specifically has coverage for pseudomonas, which other you know, antibiotics that have gram-negative coverage does not cover. I'm also going to acknowledge that antibiotic choice might be institution-specific, and that would be because of local antibiotic resistance patterns. Yeah, exactly. And that kind of gram-negative um, sepsis can get really scary really quickly. Um, so that's why it's really important that we have these antibiotics started within 30 minutes of a patient's fever if they're in the hospital or presentation to the hospital. Um, so because of that, we do a lot of education with our HEMOC families about checking temperatures at home and then when to come into the hospital for evaluation. Okay. Okay. So now we've officially ordered our antibiotics. <laughs> We're ready to go see our patient. Um, you walk in the room. She looks great on exam. She's alert and oriented. Her heart and lungs sound clear, um, no murmurs, um, and her abdomen is very soft and non-distended. New port site looks good, no redness or swelling. Um, based on this exam, is there anything else you want to do at this point, Chris? You know what? It sounds like the patient looks as billed and the, the nurse did a great job of evaluating and sort of giving us that um, gestalt. And I agree, like there really isn't anything else here that I'm worried about right now um, based on the exam alone. I sometimes ask kids if they're having any respiratory symptoms as, you know, maybe a respiratory panel could be helpful. Also knowing that you're on a unit with a lot of kids that are immunocompromised and making sure that whatever is going on is not going to like spread to somebody else. Right. So that's like another thing I might think about, but that's all. Yeah, I agree. I think we really um, covered things with our initial orders. Um, but what if she presented with different, different physical exam findings? Um, I was hoping that we could go through a couple of more patient scenarios to see how our workup and management might change based on different physical exam findings. That'd be super helpful. Okay, great. So say you walk into a room and your patient actually has moderate diffuse abdominal pain, no rebound, guarding, any diagnoses that you want to think about in this patient, especially if they're neutropenic? So I think a big one that I remember specifically in this population, Annie, is tiflitis being something that we worry about in a neutropenic patient. For sure. And then on the differential, of course, you have to think of other things that it could go on in the belly, whether they have appendicitis, you know, if they have a tumor in their belly and they could have an obstructive bowel pattern or even like a UTI, which we're already thinking about, I think, um, with the labs we've gotten. Right. But, you know, for folks that don't know much about tiflitis, do you want to just talk a little bit about that, too? Yeah. So tiflitis is really just kind of a, a fancy name for um, inflammation in the small bowel, but specifically in these neutropenic patients. Um, so really, it's something that, again, we talked about how um, easy, areas with you know thinner mucosa have easy introduction to inflammation and infection. And so basically, that's just saying in the small bowel, generally the ileocecal region where we're going to get inflammation um, in the setting of uh, patients who have low neutrophil counts. And so that's a great differential that you brought up. Are there any imaging studies that you would want to obtain then in this case? Yeah, I would want to get an x-ray um, because that can tell us, gosh, is there any free air in the abdomen? Is there any like enlargement of the bowel that might be suggestive of tiflitis? Mm -hmm. um, and then just get a sense if they're having any diarrhea or any other like GI type symptoms that might make me think um, maybe we need to get an infectious diarrheal panel or something along those lines. Yeah. 
So that's perfect. Um, and so if we're concerned for any sort of um, gastrointestinal infection, in addition to your cefepime, you're going to want to add metronidazole or flagyl. Um, you could also consider, instead of cefepime, ordering piptazo or zosin. And that is because we have some concerns, it sounds like, for an intra-abdominal infection, right? right? So adding antibiotics for anaerobic coverage in particular. Yeah. Um, so let's go to another one and say, you know, you walk in the room and your patient says, oh, yeah, my port site just feels really painful. So you look at the area, you see there's a little bit of redness um, and some warmth around the site. Um, anything that you're thinking about here, Chris? Like a cellulitis, you know, an over abscess, you know, something underneath the skin there. Definitely would want to feel it. If there's any fluctuance, maybe get an ultrasound to better assess if there's like a fluid collection. Mm -hmm. I think also if they're on only cefepime, I know we talked about before, the most common skin flora is going to be our gram positives. Right. So wanting to make sure that we probably add on another antibiotic in this situation too. Yeah, for sure. And vancomycin would generally be your kind of go-to um, for any sort of like cellulitis um, concern for gram positive infection. Um, and just something else to remember is that... Uh, if this patient was also admitted within the last 90 days there um, and had a MRSA infection, that's our other one that vancomycin was going to cover for us. Okay. Um, we would want to make sure to add that right away to the cefepime as well. Um, I also think it's important to keep in mind that um, this patient has low neutrophils, right? We know that mm -hmm. our neutrophils are our first responders that are going to cause those um, symptoms such as redness, warmth, pus when it comes to any infection. So if a neutropenic patient doesn't necessarily show these typical signs and symptoms, if she's still complaining of, you know, pain in that area, I think it's really important to keep that um, skin soft tissue infection high on the differential. Okay. Um, okay. So we're ramping it up a little bit. Stakes are a little higher here. You walk in the room and your patient is slightly drowsy. She's ill appearing. She has a really bad headache. Oh, wow. Anything you're worried about or um, specific physical exam things that you would want to look for? Well, I'm glad we already got the labs and have the antibiotics ordered. Right. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think what you're thinking about here, making sure we don't miss is something like meningitis. You know, um, you're immunocompromised. You're just at higher risk for these more serious infections. Um, I think there's, you know, some good exam findings that we could try out. The, the Koenig sign or Budinsky sign, ah, you know, yes. that, that meningitis. Uh, gismus type um, symptoms when you either like flex the neck or like lift the legs. Um, you know, I heard she had the LP within mm -hmm. the past three days. So I wouldn't expect this to be an LP headache, but like that's always something else to consider in the hemoc patients of like when was the last time they had their LP. Right. Um, you know, other things can cause headache and, you know, just feeling horrible when you're sick. Um, so, you know, most likely it's not meningitis, but if she's looking really bad, she's going to probably need an LP, unfortunately. Right. Exactly. Um, and, you know, the one thing to think about is that in these patients that are going to be a little bit sicker, like if meningitis is on the differential, I think you're definitely going to want to add your vancomycin again for that gram positive coxide coverage um, okay. and consider ampicillin for listeria coverage. Um, you know, we always mm. think about that with pregnant women and cheese, but it really comes into play with these patients with uh, low neutrophil counts as well. Um, and then you kind of already mentioned getting that um, likely another lumbar puncture to make sure there's nothing seated in there. Um, and then, of course, looking at, you know, is there any reason that she might have risks for HSV that you would need to add on acyclovir? Annie, what I see you're pointing out here is that these patients are immunocompromised and are at risk for opportunistic infections. So when they're sick, we're going to want to make sure that we keep our differential a little more broad. So you could consider things like fungal infections, viral infections like CMV, EBV, or even pneumocystis pneumonia. Yeah. So I think that was perfect. And then, you know, the scariest thing that I always want to think about when anything's happening in the brain um, is just increased intracranial pressure. So, right, that can cause your really bad headaches especially if this patient, you know, may have a brain tumor. Um, do you remember what the kind of Cushing triad that you're looking for in these patients might be? I feel like I always look this up every time I think yeah. about it, <laughs> but it's um, bradycardia, yep. you know, breathing irregularly, 
and then yeah. that widen pulse pressure. So just having like the diastolic and systolic being further and further apart from each other. Right, exactly. So always making sure, again, we got a good set of vitals, just making sure you're keeping those kind of really scary things in the back of your mind for these patients. Mm-hmm. Um, and so fine of one uh, other kind of scenario of a sicker patient is instead the nurse calls you and, you know, we talked about vitals, say that she's actually tachycardic to the 150s, hypotensive to, you know, 80s over 50s, which is much lower oh, than no. her base. Yeah, yeah, much lower than her baseline. <laughs> like, what are what are you going to um, to get this sorted out? Yeah, I know that this is a topic that we're going to address as part of this podcast as well. So we won't go into as much detail here, but I'm okay. worried about sepsis. Yeah, for um, sure. So, um, thinking about now, do we have boluses ordered? Like, I think she needs some fluid. Mm-hmm. She, you know, she's tachycardic. She's hypotensive. She's had a fever. So she meets our SIRS criteria just with the tachycardia and a fever. Right. And then, you know, she has signs of an organ of concerns with her hypotension for sure. Right. So would want to make sure we're getting those antibiotics in soon, giving her boluses. And if she doesn't seem to be responding to those boluses, probably calling our PICU. Yes, 100%. Because if you're going to need that blood pressure support, um, you're definitely going to need to be in the ICU for that. Um, and again, I think in this case, when someone is really sick, you're going to want to think about broadening your coverage for your antibiotics even further and definitely include that MRSA coverage because, you know, that and the gram-negative bacteremias are the ones that are really going to have this kind of quick escalation um, in how sick the patient can get. So I think that is um, perfect. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is all pretty scary, right? Like seeing these patients, seeing how quickly things can change. Um, we kind of alluded to this before, but we really, you know, try to encourage a lot of education to the families of these patients. Um, but kind of think about a patient who the family is coming in for the first time with their kiddo who has a neutropenic fever. They're really anxious. Kind of how might you approach the situation? How would you discuss it with the family? Yeah. So it's going to depend on the age of the patient, right? And the family. But, you know, if you're in that acute moment and someone's really anxious, I think letting them know we have a standardized way that we approach fever in patients that are on our oncology service, including getting labs, giving antibiotics as soon as we can after we get those labs. And then, you know, we'll certainly let you know as we get information back. Um, But essentially, we just do this out of abundance of caution to keep kids safe. Yeah, that's perfect. And I think just reassuring them again, like you said, that this is something we do see all the time, but that doesn't mean that we're going to take it any less seriously for your kiddo and just really making sure to emphasize, emphasize that their safety is the most important thing and we'll kind of walk them through every step of the way. So I think that's perfect. Annie, thanks so much for joining and designing such a fantastic episode for us. Oh, of course. It was a pleasure to be here. Um, And I hope this really just is helpful for people as they're, you know, entering their pediatrics residency and just becoming familiar with these patients. Because like we said, you'll definitely see it all the time. And so want to make sure that everyone feels comfortable and prepared to take care of these patients as the best they can. Now that we've reached the conclusion of the podcast, I just wanted to review the objectives to make sure you're taking away all the big points. I'm hoping that you feel more comfortable approaching a hemonc patient that develops a fever, that you now know the definition of neutropenia, and when that becomes clinically important when someone's febrile. The considerations in thinking about when patients have a central line and how to approach someone who has a fever in a central line. Generally, cross coverage, especially overnight care for patients, and how to optimize care, even partner with nurses to make things a little bit easier and figure out the urgency of those problems that are coming up. Hopefully you're taking away things that also apply specifically to the hemonc population, such as avoiding NSAIDs in patients with thrombocytopenia, and also avoiding unnecessary instrumentation, such as rectal temperature or catheterizations, and also how to approach different clinical scenarios involving febrile neutropenia and the exam findings to look for, such as looking at their central line, doing a good belly exam, evaluating mental status and signs of meningitis, and what to do if you do find abnormalities on their exam. And finally, how to compassionately talk with families and patients about the diagnosis of febrile neutropenia and 
make them feel more comfortable with your care. I want to extend a special thanks to Annie for being our content champion for this podcast episode and to our advisor, Dr. Jody Ehrman, for fact-checking. Thanks again for joining us on First Pediatrics, and we look forward to seeing you next time.